This program is brought to you by Emory University. Uh, this, I think, was actually in the posted thing, right? This guy was in your article, and I thought you, in the, in the video, I thought you may want to know what happened to him. So Duane lived about three years or so after the video was done. Uh, it was made like 2001 or something, and he died in 2005, so four, three, four years, whatever. Um, but you remember him, yes? Was he the He, the, I think he was thalidomide, right? Because he had all the tingling and stuff, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, so I thought I would, this one is not totally new, but we had, we talked about this in class, and I thought I would just kind of finish up a little bit with sort of this whole NSAID thing and cancer. So they have, there's evidence here that a daily aspirin can actually fight cancers. And here's one that came out last month uh, where they actually did a pretty big study, uh, 22,000 men uh, that they followed. And people who took the, the aspirin while they had cancer, so this is treatment, right? People that were taking it while they had cancer had a reduced chance of dying, right? 39% lower, which is pretty good for just taking it some aspirin. Okay. So NSAIDs are probably fairly potent uh, as a way of, of blocking cancer. This was a, another thing that this just came out. Uh, it, in, uh, you know, we actually, I just saw it, although it says February 11th. I can't believe I'm so far behind. But, but here's the deal. This is the coolest paper ever. What they did in this paper was they took animals and they made them transgenic for a gene that actually, what it is, it has a caspase. It's a fusion protein that has a caspase. What do caspases do? Apoptosis, right? Caspases trigger apoptosis. So this is a fusion protein that has a caspase. It's driven by the, the inc 4 a the ARF promoter. So when cells turn on ARF and they're going to become senescent, it turns on this transgene, yes? ARF, senescence, Does this make sense? It turns on this gene and it actually kills the cells that are senescent. So as the cells become senescent over the course of the animal's life, they're killed. Right? So this is what happens when you ablate senescent cells in a living organism. This is an animal that looks healthy, his fur is sleek, back looks good, all happy looking. This is an animal that's the same age. Uh, it's humped up. Remember we saw that phenotype with the P53 aging mouse? Uh, and it, you know, it's just ratty looking, eyes don't even look good. Everything was better in these animals when they just got rid of senescent cells. Right? Which is a good indication that, this, that having these senescent cells is another reason why cancer and aging are linked. Right? The older you are, the more senescent cells you have. They accumulate over time. Remember, they don't die. They just hang out. And they probably are promoting a very low level of inflammation. Right? So uh, if we could figure out a way to just kill the senescent cells, it, it, it's, it actually made the animals younger looking, right? I mean, they almost reversed aging in the animals with this. Uh, pretty, pretty dramatic uh, response. So I, th I thought that was worth sharing. Pretty cool. Okay. So what we're going to talk about now is metastasis. And metastasis is the movement of cancer from its original location, what's called the primary tumor, the primary location, to a distant location, some place that's outside of that, that area, right? So breast going to lung or to brain or, or bone or something like that, metastasis, right? And it's really important. You'll hear this all the time. In fact, uh, if you, anyone here seen the movie Dodgeball? All right, how many sought to serve with love? How many saw Dodgeball? Okay, that says a lot, okay? So, so in the movie Dodgeball, Lance Armstrong's in there, right? Remember that? Meets him in the bar, he's depressed. You got the scene? Right? And Lance says, oh, what's wrong with you? I had brain and testicular and liver cancer. He didn't, right? He had the same cancer that was in different locations. That's a super common thing that you hear is that people, if they have prostate cancer and it goes to their brain, then they think they have brain cancer. No, they have prostate cancer that has moved to their brain. Okay? Still prostate cancer. 
Right? And that's uh, something that you can use to educate people with, because okay? they're treated the same. Right? It's different. Okay. So here's metastatic melanoma. So here is a, a melanoma. It's, an, it's a good cancer to look at metastasis because melanocytes are pigmented. They're brown. You can see them. Okay. So this is, this is an excision. Uh, here, this is actually probably the, where this tie is was an original excision. It was like re-excised. Uh, this is an excised tumor. This is what it looks like when the tumor migrates under the skin. Uh, it's spreading. You see all these black dots, right? And of course, this large black thing, that's all melanoma that's moving. It moves along the, the lymphat through the lymphatic channels and through blood vessels. This is what it looks like when it gets into a lymph node. That lymph node is completely overcome, right? Lymph nodes are grape-like structures. We have them under our arms, in your groin, behind your neck, uh, down here. That's why you swell up if you get mono or something, right? It swells up real big. Those are your lymph nodes. And they're immune organs, uh, but they tend to collect uh, the cells. So it's like a filter. So the cancer cells get stuck in there, and they grow in the lymph node. Here's what the, the a liver looks like. Uh, which is completely overrun, right? Every one of those dark spots is a different metastatic lesion from melanoma. Okay? So the, the cancers, we'll talk about why they go where they go and things like that, but this is what it looks like. Okay? It, will spread, it spreads all over the place. Okay? Not all cancers are created equal. Metastatic cancer is responsible for about 90%. It's the one thing you'll remember forever from this class, right? <laughs> RAS? I don't know, but 90. Yeah. Right? Okay. So some cancers don't pose threats to the person in their primary location. A great example of a cancer which doesn't do that is breast cancer. You do not need your breast to live, right? It's a blob of fat with some ducks in there to make milk. You can remove a woman's breast and she survives absolutely fine. Not a vital organ. Breast cancer kills when it moves to other locations and impairs the function of those organs. It goes to lungs, it goes to bone, it goes to liver. Okay? So uh, some of them really can't do anything to you unless they move. Uh, there are cancers, of course, that can have serious or lethal effects without going anywhere. Uh, that is, the organs uh, that are really important, for instance, the brain is an obvious one. In particular, the brain, even a benign cancer can kill you because it's inside a bony box, right? So if you have something big that grows in there, it's going to crush the normal tissue, right? So it's space restricted. Uh, but uh, other organs can also cause major problems, right, without a lot of spread by impinging on the activity of the organ itself. Yeah. Sorry, she's channeling for you. Yeah, go ahead. They do. Yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah, it's hard to get treatments in though. Go ahead, Marie. Invasive cancer. Yeah. So, so if cancer if cancer is contained like that, three hundred pound tumor that woman had, right, or the 35 pound, that baby tumor I sent you online on Blackboard, right? <laughs> An infant tumor, right? It's only like 30 some pounds, right? So, so that was big and it, could, and it could overcome local area, but it's when it spreads to a distant area that it becomes malignant, right? Or when it, it, when it pierces, when it starts to spread and invade nearby. Because they, they typically grow, benign tumors grow, and you'll see this because the pathologist is going to come and show them to you. Okay, so you can have benign tumors that grow, but they grow in sort of a sphere-like area. They fill up whatever hollow space, whatever's there, and they're contained by basement membranes and things like that, or the renal capsule, like we saw. It will be contained. If it punches through that, then you would say uh, it's invasive. This is more cancer. Yeah, it's a good question. It's kind of a fine thing. Point. Yeah. So Andy. Yeah, but to a pathologist, I think the person wouldn't agree. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but the pathological definition, but not the standard definition of benign. Yeah, yeah, okay. And there's a, a very clear correlation 
uh, of the size of tumor at the, uh, at the diagnosis with metastasis. So here it shows you that, and it's not completely obvious, right? It seems, at first you think, oh, of course, the bigger it is, the more it is. But we'll talk about that. That's not necessarily the case always. Um, but the smaller the tumor, the less likely it is that that person has distant metastases. At some point, right, uh, when you're up around five inches or so, right, a centimeter, two point something, right, uh, centimeters and an inch. So uh, when you're up around five centimeters or so, uh, it sort of plateaus out. Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of, we'll talk about some of them, but there's all kinds of reasons. There's all kinds of reasons, yeah. But, but just the obvious, the, the correlation, it's not causation, right? But the correlation is that if you are discovered to have a large tumor, you are more likely to have distant disease, right? It's not necessarily why you have it, but it just is. Well, is yeah. that kind of inherent, though, because, like, <laughs> when, you're, when you're finding it, you're going to find it when it comes bigger. So at that point, it's going to run longer. Like, is it, it, doesn't that have to kind of be the case? I mean, m my wife's tumor, when they found it, was a centimeter at its biggest. And some people have 35 tumors. So yeah, I mean, so it's a huge range, right? And the better detection becomes now, the smaller and smaller we're finding them, right? Breast cancer is a great example, right? We can find teeny little growth, yeah. Uh, the larger the tumor becomes, is it more likely that cancer cells are directly metastasized, metastasized from the big tumor or the underlying, some underlying cells? Well, the cancer cells are the ones that have to leave in order to make a tumor somewhere else, right? We'll see in our papers coming up that stromal cells do leave, but they're not going to make another tumor by themselves. So the cancer cells are the ones that have to leave. We'll, let's table it for just a sec, because we'll, we'll come back to it, right? We'll talk about why do they leave and stuff like that in a sec. Okay. So, <clears throat> again, what we said is that cancers have been around for a long time, right? As Aaron pointed out, I mean, these are, these are old things. Uh, again, my wife's cancer at one centimeter was probably five to seven years in the making. Uh, so it's a long time. I mean, it's a long time that they have to do that. Uh, they can have a lot of cells in them, uh, but and most of them aren't detected until they're about the size that hers was, right? Um, that's about the size. But when you think about, remember that doubling thing, right? Where we said one centimeter, two centimeter, four in three more days, that's, it's three quarters of their lifetime is already just to get to one centimeter. And then rapidly after that, right? So they've been around a long time before they get there. It, it's thought, though, that many metastases occur prior to diagnosis, right? That, that even small tumors can shed. It used to be, the dogma was sort of, oh, they don't really throw off uh, cells, metastatic cells, until they're big. But we know that's not the case now, because we're much better at detecting circulating cells, right? We have the methods now where we can find them in circulation at very low numbers. So we can, you, can, you can find these things even when the tumors are pretty small. Okay. So what we know is that if you have a, a, a one centimeter tumor or so, it can shed about a million cells per day or something like that, right? Some, some huge number, right? So they can lose a lot of cells. Uh, and... Uh, but we don't get a million metastases. You get a very finite number, small number. Some people don't get any number of metastases. So it's an extremely unsuccessful event. Right? Metastasis is, is fraught with peril if you're a cancer cell. Most of them don't make it. So what are the challenges that they face? What do they have to do to set up shop when they're in a new location? Right? So first, they have to become modal. Right? I mean, again, going back to the very first day, and I've repeated it several times, you go to bed at night, your liver is in one place. When you wake up, it's in the same place. And that's the way the liver cells are. Right? So, but the cells, if they're going to move from to liver to somewhere else, they have to become modal. They have to be able to invade. They have to get into the blood supply or lymphatic vessels. 
And the term for that, and we'll look at it again, it's called intravasation. That's the invasion of blood vessels or lymphatic vessels. Intravasation. They have to get in. Then they have to survive in what is a raging river for them. We're talking class 5 rapids here, if you're an epithelial cell, right? So these things are really going to be buffeted by the blood. And I'll sh actually, prob I'll show you a little video of even what it's like in a lymphatic vessel, but the blood cells are much, much smaller than epithelial cells. And so if you put something big in there, and again, I think I might have some pictures. If not, I think you'll see some from the pathology person. Epithelial cells are much bigger. And so the holes and the openings in these tubes that the little cells, the lymphocytes can grow through, and red cells are really even small, they can zip right through that. The epithelial cells get smashed to pieces in there, right? So it's, it's very dangerous uh, for them. Then they have to stop somewhere, right? Maybe they stick to the side. Maybe they just get stuck in a capillary bed because the openings are just too small to go through, right? They get caught like in a filter. Uh, so they have to stop somewhere. And then they have to get out of the blood vessel which is called extravasation, then they have to attract or induce a new stroma. And as we're going to see, and as be is becoming more and more evident, just one sec, is more and more evident, right, is the fact that the, the niche, this place where the cancer cells go, very frequently is prepped ahead of time, right? So they arrest there, and it's not necessarily random, right, where they stop. So the stroma uh, may already be at least partially prepared for them because of exosomes, because of other things that have been secreted uh, by the, the primary tumor or from the bone marrow. Right? So we're, we're, the, the picture sort of changing now that we understand how they lay out the map ahead. Yeah. No, I mean, so sometimes tumors will wrap around a blood vessel and sort of in, in, encase it, right? You, like, you know, you are mine now, right? Uh, sort, of, sort of wrap around it. But unless the tumor cell actually penetrates, that's not intravasation. Intravasation is when the epithelial cell, the cancer cell, goes through. Right? And I'll, I'll show you a picture of it. Right? And then when they get to this distant location, and, okay, okay, you got me, Cole, go, what? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, that's called the vascular mimicry. Yeah, so that, so the intravasation is getting into the blood supply. If you're already a fake blood supply and you slip off without anyone seeing into the blood supply. I'm going to guess that's probably still called intravasation, but that's not typically when people are talking about it. They're usually talking about the invasion of an existing real blood vessel. But, yeah. That's a good question. I'm glad I stopped. Okay. All right. And then, when these, when these tumor cells are in this new environment, right, they have to be able to proliferate and get a new blood supply if they're going to get more than a millimeter, right? And the thinking is, and the, and the video that you saw, right, the animations that you saw in the Falkman video, hopefully make it, it clear, right, that there's probably lots and lots of these dormant, called micrometastases, right, that are out there. And they don't have a blood supply, and they're just sort of sitting there, right? And the thinking with breast cancer is that these cells can live 10, 20, or more years. Right? So when someone, like my wife, again, for example, right, they won't say you're cured. Right? They won't use the C word. <laughs> right? They'll say, we can't find anything, you're okay, whatever, but we don't know right, how long it can be uh, until you may get a recurrence. Something will happen that flip that angiogenic switch. Right, something happens and th they get a blood supply. Yeah. Is there always like, metas like metastasis occurring? And it might be dormant, which is why you don't say you're cured? I mean, that some tumors. Don't know 
some some tumors are much more likely to to spread than others. I mean, uh, some of them like leukemia, like you can say you're cured kind of thing. You know, you you can pretty much do that with some of them. But when someone has distant disease, it's very hard to ever know. Uh, yeah, you, it's hard. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, the small. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, the smaller the tumor is, and the that one of the things that happens when you are diagnosed with cancer is they will look at the lymph nodes in the area, right? The so-called regional lymph nodes, and they'll they'll look in those and they stain for epithelial markers, right? They look for cancer cells, and and if they don't find any, then it's a much better chance. If they're not local, then they're not far away either, right? So, but it's no guarantee. Right, they could slip through there and not stick there. So there's no way of knowing. Yeah? Um, if you're treating a patient with chemo who has metastatic disease, does usually all the different cancer spots respond similarly to the same treatment? Or sometimes like one tumor might grow more volume than once? Absolutely. That the latter is the case. He said, do all of the cancers respond the same to treatment, both the primary and the metastatic lesions? The answer is there's no reason to think that. Uh, they are heter heterogeneous. The ones that left have a different phenotype. They're able to leave and survive and get there. So they're different than the ones that stayed behind, in, in part. Um, but, but you don't know. If they're dormant, then it's very hard to kill them with chemo, because chemo is killing actively dividing cells, and these things are just sort of sitting there. So you wouldn't know if they were sensitive anyway. Right. But, but there's no reason to think that all the sites would be, for lots of reasons. I mean, sometimes the drugs can't get there. Sometimes they get the air equally, but they're genetically different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Very curious group today. <laughs> I'm wondering, uh, with these uh, micrometastases, if they um, don't get a, a steady blood supply, they're, they're in a, I guess they're in a hypoxic. Well, I mean, they usually, they'll come out from a blood vessel, right? I mean, that's what they come out of, typically. So they're near a blood, they might have a, a blood supply adequate enough to keep them going, but not enough to get big. And they're not making enough of the angiogenic factors to overcome the anti-angiogenic factors, right? That's always a battle. So they're just sort of sitting. So they don't have enough, I guess, enough blood supply to, like, Right. Well, I mean, they may divide and die at the same rate, but the point is they're not growing. I mean, they may grow at a certain level and die at a certain level, but they're just not, they're not growing. So why do, why do the cells leave, right? What is it that causes them to up and, and get out of there? And, and hypoxia is one of the main driving forces, right? And so it, they, they, they do undergo this anaerobic metabolism that we've talked about, this over-reliance uh, on glycolysis, right? So they don't have oxygen, so you can't go through the, the, the ETC, right, Krebs cycle and ETC, so they rely on glycolysis. But even if in the presence of oxygen, a lot of cancer cells still do that, right? Probably because they're generating products they can use to build cell components. So it's to their, to their advantage, right? So you get this decreased pH. Uh, you do get increased genetic instability. There's epigenetic effects that, is indu that are induced by hypoxia, right? So you have altered gene expression. You have altered cell-cell interactions due to hypoxia, and I'll show you what drives all these in a second. But you have a, you have a bunch of changes, the tissue uh, the ECM gets remodeled, in part because maybe you want to allow blood vessels in, in part because the macrophages are chopping things up uh, and allowing you to leave uh, because you have this sort of inflammatory situation. You do get angiogenesis, which provides your highway system to get to distant parts of the body. Okay. And hypoxia drives the epithelial to mesenchymal transition. Right. And these mesenchymal cells are sort of primitive cells. They're loose connected. It's the connective tissue cells, like fibroblasts. And they are intrinsically more modal. Right? The mesenchymal phenotype includes motility. Right? They, 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 they begin to be able to move. Yeah. Why does hypoxia drive EMP? I'm going to show you. Okay. I promise. This is a plot, isn't it, of some kind? No, it's okay. <laughs> okay. It's because of the quiz, right? No. Okay. So 
how does hypoxia get sensed, right? Um, so it, it turns out that the driving transcription factor for hypoxia is, a, is called hypoxia-induced factor, perfectly named, right? Hypoxia-induced factor 1 alpha. And HIF1 alpha works as part of a heterodimer, and HIF1 beta, the partner, is there all the time. Right? It's, it's constitutively made. It's, it's there all the time. So whether you're going to get an active transcription factor depends on whether or not you have active HIF1 alpha. Yes? Right? Whether you have HIF1 alpha that's able to work. So here's how it works. In normal oxygen levels, HIF1 alpha actually gets uh, modified it, by an enzyme called proleal hydroxylase. It adds an oxygen to HIF1 alpha. HIF1 alpha then gets this modified proline with a hydroxyl group on it, and that combines with a protein complex called the von hippel lindau complex, which we'll talk about in a moment, but VHL. And the VHL complex, like APC and other things that we've seen, controls the destruction of this uh, HIF1 alpha. So VHL is, is uh, ubiquitin ligase. It, it, it is able to add ubiquitin to this. You polyubiquitinate this, it goes to a proteasome and it gets destroyed. So you're making HIF1 alpha all the time and you are destroying it if oxygen is present. Yes? So it's a direct sensor, pretty cool, right? A direct oxygen sensor. If oxygen is not present, none of this stuff happens downstream. You don't have the oxygen for this proleal hydroxylase, and HIF1 alpha is stable, it binds with HIF1 beta, and you get transcription. Okay? All right. So, what happens if it isn't destroyed? Well, if it's not destroyed, you get this von Hippel-Lindau syndrome, which is what VHL stands for. And it includes a bunch of inherited cancers. Right? A bunch of inherited cancers. Because the, the HIF1 alpha targets the genes that are responsible for EMT. Okay? Uh, and we'll talk about some of those in class. I'll show you, I think I have a slide where you're going to see one. One of the main ones is a gene called TWIST, right? which is in our papers, right? but TWIST. Okay. So what does it do? Here's HIF1-alpha, here's the HIF1-alpha-beta heterodimer, and it binds to DNA. It targets metabolic genes, ergo, glycolysis changes. Right. It targets angiogenesis genes, because if oxygen is low, you definitely want to get blood vessels in there in a normal situation. So you drive the expression of things like VEGF, and it uh, alters motility-related genes, that is the RAS uh, proteins that are associated with the cytoskeleton, the thing that drives cytoskeleton rearrangement and movement of cells, and the EMT genes, in particular, twist. Right? And there are other regulations of this, right? And so it talks with other systems. Okay? But that, that's HIF1-alpha. That's, that's what it does. And so I thought that this was particularly cool. Uh, again, this just this came out as least more recent than the other one. Uh, right? so, so this just came out, and this is an article where they actually looked at chronic stress. And they were like, well, how come, how does chronic stress play into tumor cell dissemination, metastasis? Right? Because there was some indications that it does. And what they found was that uh, this is a, a non-stressed animal. This is, a, this is, you're looking inside a lymphatic vessel of the animal. So that's the lymph fluid flowing through a stained lymphatic vessel. They put teeny little particles in there that they could track, these little nanoparticles with color, just so they could watch the flow. And what you find is that if you stress the animals, the lymph moves faster. Right? 
it moves faster, and there's more pressure in there. And the thinking is that that is very likely to assist the movement of these big epithelial cells. Right? You, you, you turn the pressure up, and you can push them downstream. So this actually is tied to what? What do you think? Stress. How is stress connected to lymphatic vessels? Inflammation. What, is it, what do lymphatics do? What's their job? They hold immune cells, right? So this is all tied to inflammation, right? So, th so it was actually tied to cyclooxygenase, COX-2, right? The same enzyme I mentioned before, COX enzymes are what are blocked by NSAIDs, right? Like an aspirin blocks uh, cyclooxygenase. Okay. So uh, the, the epithelial cells when they move, they look more like mesenchymal cells, right? And again, the term for this, for the, I don't know, fifth time, right, is the epithelial mesenchymal transition. Should you know that abbreviation? Probably a good one. Probably a good one. I, don't, I usually spell things out for you, right? Even in the test, spell it out anyway. You should know this one. Okay? So EMT, you will see it all the time in the literature. Right? All the time in the literature, and uh, that, that's, that's what it's called. Um, and the alterations in cell surface proteins allow for migration. Again, you have to let go, and then you have to reattach. So when you walk, you, you have to be able to pick your foot up, but then you have to put it back down. But you have to be able to let go of that back one, or you're stuck. Right. So it's a fine line between being walking and being stuck to the floor. Right? You have to be able to pick up your feet, move them. Cells do the same thing. They have lots of little receptors on their surface. I'll show you a picture in a moment of that. But they change the proteins on the surface. They change from ones that stick very tightly, epithelial cells welded together, holding on to everything, to one that doesn't hold on quite as much. Right? It allows them to sort of roll that membrane, reach forward, and crawl push it out. It would be like walking in a bubble, right? If I was inside a big sphere, or like those cool things that the kids get in in the pools, right? Uh, where it rolls, it would stick to something in the front, and then that next part, that membrane would roll over the top, right? You just keep pushing it forward, forward. You pull the back up like that. And you can roll across uh, the uh, surface of something, right? And again, the cytoskeleton which gives structure to cells, just like our skeleton gives us structure. It would be hard to walk if we didn't have skeletons. Right? So our skeletons give us structure. Cytoskeletons give cells structure. And they also have to rearrange and align so that the cells can crawl. Right? So here's how cells look when they're stuck to each other. Right? You have calcium-dependent adherence. Cadherins are the name of the protein. It stands for calcium-dependent adherence, cadherins. So the cadherins hold cells together, and those cadherins change during EMT, right, to ones that are, don't hold on quite as tight. Okay? And uh, the same thing is true here. Uh, in, where you have the plasma membrane of a cell. So here is the actin filament inside a cell. Here's the, the bilayer. Here's the ECM. Up is the ECM. Down is the cell. You change that, right, to allow the cell to migrate. You allow the cell to roll. And uh, this is uh, the integrin. And we're going to look at a picture of that in a second. I'm just highlighting it for you, right? It's how the cell holds on. And then catenin. Where have we ever heard that word before? Beta catenin. There are signal transducing proteins. This one is actually probably alpha catenin. But there are signal transducing proteins like beta catenin that are tethered to the extracellular matrix. So now you can see why if a cell lets go and changes this structure, you can get gene expression changes because beta catenin lets go and goes into the nucleus. So how would you go from, I'm holding on to something, you let go, how does that change your behavior? That's how. Right? 
you let that transcription factor, which is holding on to cytoskeleton, go into the nucleus. And so you can change behavior. Uh, cells can sense stress, tension. Right? They know if they're holding on to something. Okay. And uh, this is a, a paper that, again, uh, is a, about a year old or so. And what they showed was that the more stiff Remember, we keep saying that the matrix is, is thick and hard, desmoplastic, to use the fancy term, right, in a tumor. Too much extracellular matrix, it makes it hard and stiff. That's how you feel a tumor if you palpate one, right, is that hardness. It's not the cancer cells you're feeling, right? It's, it's that, the proteins they lay down. And it seems that that stiffness actually drives the transition because of those connections that we just looked at. Right? It changes signaling. It changes the signals inside the cell if you change the outside. And here is the target, twist. Twist one. Twist leaves the cytoplasm and goes into the nucleus. Right? And twist targets a bunch of genes that alter the behavior of the cell, right? make it more modal, things like that. Yeah? So for a benign uh, tumor, if it's not, a benign tumor wouldn't metastasize. Right. Correct. So, but if it's a benign tumor, tumor wouldn't it still feel uh, stiff? I mean, they, they, they can, they just haven't, I mean, they do, they're abnormal, but they don't go the whole nine yards, right? But if so, 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 so they, may, they may feel abnormal, but maybe it's not the same combination of collagens that you would get in one that's going to allow metastasis to work better okay. or something, right? Because there's lots of things that these cells can produce. So it's probably slightly different. I don't know exactly. I mean, the answer, I don't know exactly, but there's got to be a difference between them. I, mean, I can't, I don't know the, the one, right? So again, this is, this is a cell. It's got this, this ring of actin in it, this actin cortex, and it's got the lamellipodium, which is the foot, right, that's going out in front of, the, of it. And essentially, like I said, you have this thing under tension. You, you polymerize actin in the front of the cell, and you pull the membrane up from the back. And that's how they crawl. And the term for that in cancer cells, uh, typically, you'll, you'll see the word invadopodium. Pod's for foot, right? And, right? Podiatrist does your feet, right? So pod is for foot. So invade a podium. So there is the, the cell foot, right, that's allowing this thing to invade. Okay? And this came out a couple days ago, and I thought this was really interesting. Very, very interesting thing. So this was an abstract, so I, there's no paper yet, right? It was presented at a meeting. But what they found was that if you have this stiff matrix, if the cells crawl through that, it sort of squishes their nucleus and it causes mutations. They can actually induce mutation because of the physical properties, because these cells are squishing through very small areas and it can actually cause damage. And they were able to measure differences in the mutation rates in the cells that were crawling through these little pores versus big pores. So maybe the very act of moving is going to increase genetic instability, right? And allow you more variation, allow you to select for a new phenotype, right? right? That's always what this mutation does. You shoot the shotgun at the genome and then see what comes out, right? Is this a better phenotype? Do I live better or not? You just select, right? Select always uh, for the one. But I thought that, I thought that was pretty cool. <coughs> and we have talked <coughs> a lot about uh, this, the inflammation and the fact that, that cancer cells don't reinvent the wheel. They reuse existing programs, always off by a little bit. Right? They, they make blood vessels, but they're not perfect. Right? And they make an ECM, but it's wrong, <laughs> and things like that. So this is uh, an experiment that was done, and they were actually looking at the way cells move and we keep saying that, that in the very beginning, day one, I said, what happens when you cut yourself? Remember that? What happens when you cut yourself? What do you learn? What do you do? 
Nobody curses. It's just still. You didn't learn. You learn nothing. You can learn nothing. You curse first. First thing. Right? Like, eh, like that. Something like that. Just, it doesn't have to be a lot. Just something subtle, but, you know, just let people know you're hurt. Right? Okay. So then you bleed and stuff like that. And then you have a wound. And the cells have to fill in that gap. And so people have thought that, that cancer, which they said in their presentation two days ago, right? Are cancers, do they mimic wounds that don't heal, right? Do they keep doing things that you would do in a wound, only they don't stop when they should? So, so in this work, what they did was they did both in vitro, that is, they had a cell culture and they scraped down the middle to make a wound in the monolayer, and they also did it by doing punch wounds in the skin, uh, small wounds, but little wounds in the skin of an animal. And they watched the cells to see how they healed, and then they also looked in cancer cells. Um, so this is what you see when you do that. Uh, you have, essentially, when there is an opening, okay, when there is an opening, all of the cells don't react the same way. It seems that the cells can sense mechanical stress, the tension. When, t when cells are touching each other, there's pressure on them, right? They can feel the cell next to them. When all of a sudden there's nothing there, right? All those connections that I just showed you, they're like, whoa, right? What's going on? There's nothing over here. They physically can tell there's nothing there. Those cells that are closest to that area, that have that physical change, actually change. So these are, the, these are the follower cells. These are the cells that are in the front. They rearrange their cytoskeleton. They totally change, and they become what are called leader cells. And the leader cells will start to migrate toward that open area, and all of the other cells follow them, right? Leaders and followers. Yeah, well, that would be, what in, in angiogenesis, you would call them tip and stalk. But these are just epithelial cells uh, like that. And so we're going to have right at, yes. I, I was just kidding. I was just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> the cancer stem cells, we weren't talking about migration. What w that was more of a, a hierarchy in command power, leader, follower. Meaning that the, the, the stem cells were the ones that were doing the proliferating, and they were really in charge of the tumor growth, and the other ones were more differentiated, and they don't really, they're not really the ones that are spreading the cancer. So a little different. Here we're actually talking about the movement of cells from point A to point B, right? And essentially what it seems like is that the cancer say, follow me. Right? These leader cells. And if you actually hit one of these cells with a laser, which A, sounds like great fun, and B, they did it, and I didn't get to do it. Uh, but if you do that, if you destroy one of these with a laser cell, somebody else is like, picks up the flag and becomes a leader. Okay? It looks exactly like Iwo Jima. Okay? Okay. So that's exactly how it works, right? So the, these cells will, uh, this one will take over if the front one is eliminated. And so after we come back from break, I'm actually not going anywhere, but when you come back from break, Adam Marcus, who is a researcher here at Emory and runs uh, the microscopy core, he studies metastasis using videography uh, and doing all kinds of things. And so he is going to come and show you guys what this looks like, right? Uh, and you'll get to see the video of the cancer cells. Okay? Now, the, the stromal cells that are in the area, right? We talked all about all these stromal cells that are in the environment, in the microenvironment, in a tumor. They can secrete enzymes that assist the cancer cells in invasion. The epithelial cells are not doing this alone. They definitely get help. Right? They definitely get help. And so as an example, uh, there is uh, something called urokinase, or urokinase plasminogen activator, or UPA. It's easier, right? So uh, they, there is this enzyme. It gets 
activated, it's a zymogen, it gets cut by a cathepsin, which is a proteolytic enzyme. Ultimately, it binds to the, a receptor on the tumor cell membrane and activates another enzyme, it's a cascade. Ultimately, though, what happens is that you cleave a bunch of ECM targets, right? And it allows the, the tumor cells to invade, okay? And people are actually trying to block that, right? That drug, WX671, block this right here. It blocks urokinase. And they're hoping to block this whole cascade to prevent the remodeling of the extracellular matrix and invasion by the cancer cells. There are no, as we'll talk about, there are no drugs currently approved to block metastasis. Not specifically. The MMPs or matrix metalloproteases are the dominant players in this whole process. And there are a bunch of them. Uh, you're not gonna, I don't think, have to know any of their names. They're just numbers, MMP, one, two, three, four, five, like that. There's a bunch of them. And uh, I mentioned before, they're called metalloproteases because, they're at, because of their active sites contain ions. But they target extracellular matrix proteins, uh, they can release growth factors that are tethered, stuck out in the ECM. It's like when you play a video game and you get to grab one of those little bags of energy somewhere, right? Same thing. They're out there in the ECM and these cells can actually release them and get growth factors that act locally. Wouldn't the association of higher ECM density and tumor cell migration be a little counterintuitive if uh, MMPs cut through the ECM? Well, the, the, the ECM, th that density helps the cells move, right? Because they crawl better on the dense stuff than they do the loose stuff. And you might think, like, well, doesn't that block them? Right? You're like, oh, how do I get out if there's this dense stuff? But it's 3D, right? They're not like a balloon that they're stuck in necessarily, right? So it's rather the density of the floor of the matrix versus... Like, the I mean, well, the whole thing is kind of thick, but they chew it up and get out. I mean, they, they, it's there. It's, you know, it's not a plan. I mean, if you were going to plan this whole thing, you might not build a thick thing and then chop it up. That seems inefficient, but it's a tumor. It's not thinking anything, right? So it's just they make these proteins and they have to chop them up, right? So there are a lot of MMPs. They're produced by both tumor cells and stromal cells, right? So MMPs come from both. So the calves that we talked about and we will talk about again almost certainly produce uh, some of these MMPs, uh, they're made as inactive precursors, which we've talked about. A lot of proteolytic enzymes are made in an inactive way, so you don't accidentally chop a bunch of stuff up, right? You keep them inactive until you need them, right? And some of them can be secreted, and then they actually come back to the cancer cell and stick to receptors on the membrane, and then they wield them almost like a sword, right? right on the surface, so they cut very locally, right, very locally, right when that membrane of that cell hits something, they have something to chop it, right? And there are inhibitors of these, and people, of course, are looking to mimic these and uh, develop drugs that will help block the matrix metalloproteases. The, they're called TIMPs, tissue inhibitors of the MMPs, TIMPs. An, another, the, another cleavage. They're almost always cleaved. So you need another, it's a cascade. So you need something turned on that chops something else and turns open, like caspases. So only when they're activated do they go to the cell surface? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So stromal cells make MMPs and TIMPs. So neutrophils, lymphocytes, endothelial cells, fibroblasts, all of these cells, again, not to be memorized, but to be understood. There is a, a pool of these things, right? Lots of different cells, lots of different MMPs being made. It's a soup of these things, right? And they're probably induced to produce those because of the inflammation, because of the immune cells in the area, because of the lack of oxygen, right? So again, rearranging, chopping up the ECM is a good thing if you don't have oxygen and you're a normal cell. So it makes sense. 
but they're made by lots and lots of, of different cell types. Okay, and what do they do? They they I put up here what don't they do? Right, uh, they do lots and lots of stuff. So the MMPs chop up the ECM. They expose binding sites that allow the cells to migrate. They actually will uh, uh, essentially clear a path and uh, allow the cells to stick and move. They uh, will release tethered growth factors, right? The little energy packets I was talking about. So they act very locally. Um, so things that are secreted from cells, sometimes they'll be essentially attached to the ECM, which is weird thinking about that. I think they go out there, they do something. But sometimes they're inactive. Uh, they will activate chemokines. What are chemokines? What do they do? What do they reg they regulate what? Cellular trafficking. trafficking. Cellular trafficking. Right. And we will come back to chemokines because it's one of the reasons that cancer cells spread where they do. Right. Chemokines. They activate MMPs, they cleave adhesion molecules, they allow angiogenesis, they help intravasation and extravasation by chopping up the basement membrane and making those endothelial cells separate, right? Uh, so they, they probably cause disorganization that, again, helps with EMT, right? So lots and lots of things, okay? Lots and lots of things, okay? So here's a, a kind of interesting one. Uh, it's not a specific, it's not one that you need to like memorize or anything. I just thought it was a cool way that it worked. Uh, and, and what happens here is that you have this fibroblast produced MMP and uh, it makes, it's a protease, and it comes over to the cancer cell and cleaves this transmembrane receptor. And when it does that, it just chops that little bit off. That's it, right? It just chops off that little tail. And when it does that, this thing springs over like that, interacts with this, and allows cells to move. It's like flipping a switch. I can move, I can't move, I can move. Right. Um, so to show you how a protease made by a calf can influence a cancer cell. Right. And so again, uh, the way uh, metastasis works, you have a primary tumor, you get vascularization. Some cells have to detach and they leave you get intravasation, this is the overview. They circulate somewhere, they adhere, you get extravasation, and you get growth of a secondary tumor. But the, the way it works is that the cancer cells is either force their way in between two endothelial cells. Endothelial cells are very tightly welded together. They're holding fluid, right? The, yes? They're keeping blood in there, correct? So they're very tightly welded together, but the, the cancer cells using uh, MMPs and that PAR, that's that PAR1 that I just showed you, using MMPs and other things, they essentially force their way, separate these two endothelial cells and, and force their way through. There is another way that it happens uh, which is completely bizarre to me, and that is that the cancer cells can go through endothelial cells. How does that happen? I have no earthly idea, right? But they literally force their way through. It does involve a rearrangement of the, uh, the actin and myosin uh, in that cell, but they apparently can go right across the cells. Right, go right through a cell. Excuse me. <laughs> right? uh, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. Who's amazed? That's pretty amazing. You ever see anything like that? It's amazing. So yeah, they go right through the endothelial cells. I, I'm assuming this is more common, but I know that that happens. Yeah. Huh? I don't, I don't even know the answer to that. <laughs> it can't be. It can't feel good. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't see that. Like, in, they have videos. I, I, you can see these color things, and you can see them forcing the myosin, you know, getting out of the way and everything. And it must be like phagocytosis and exocytosis just gone, like, horribly wrong. 
You know what I mean? Never eat anything bigger than your head. That's the rule, right? So, yeah. I mean, it might, but the cancer cells certainly don't care about that, yeah. right? I mean, it's not anything that it would be like selected for, right? Because what's the difference if you, you know? So I don't know, but it's really bizarre, but it happens. Okay, so what happens once you're inside the blood supply? Picture yourself as a teeny tiny little cell floating in this rushing river, right? That's what it's like, okay? It's, it's a tremendous amount of force that's in there, in these cells. So it's a very dangerous. There's high oxygen levels, and oxygen is very reactive, right? You know that. Right? So oxygen is a very reactive chemical, and the oxygen levels in blood are much higher than in the tissues, right? Where diffusion limits uh, how much you get. So it's, there are immune cells in there, right? So there are white cells, uh, and, and there are... Uh, there's mechanical stress, so the cells just get beaten up, right, by being slammed into junctions and things. Uh, they're much larger than, than the uh, cancer cells, right? The cancer cells much, much larger. Okay? So the average red blood cell is about 7 micrometers, and epithelial cells are 50 micrometers, right? So it's a big difference if you're trying to go through a small blood vessel. It's a mess in there. Okay? And as we'll see in a moment, the, the cancer cells very often travel with, epithe with um, platelets on them, right? which makes them even bigger. Right? Makes them even bigger. Okay? And epithelial cells aren't made to deform and bend and give like the leukocytes are, right? the same, and certainly not like red blood cells. So the cancer cells often become covered with platelets. So here are red blood cells. Those little teeny dots are the platelets. Here is a, a large a, a super blow-up of platelets. Remember, platelets are fragments of a bigger cell called a megakaryocyte. And platelets are involved in clotting. Right? They also have a lot of growth factors in them, like PDGF, platelet-derived growth factor, right? that we talked about again with wound healing at right? the very beginning. Okay. So when you're a cancer cell and you get covered with platelets, they wear them like armor. Right? And so the platelets take some of the hits for them mechanically. They also essentially hide the cancer cells from immune cells. Right? Nothing here but us platelets. Right? Uh, right? So they have, they have the platelets all over them and the immune cells can't see them. Right? So uh, they do activate genes in the cancer cells. So platelets actively make lots of growth factors and secrete them, and they can influence the cancer cells that they're stuck to. Uh, and so they can help EMT, they help immune evasion, they probably help those, those cells live in that environment, in the blood supply. And where do platelets go? When did we talk about platelets? What happens? You cut yourself. You... Curse. Good. Finally. Then what? Then you bleed and you clot. Why do you clot? Because platelets go there. So platelets go to sites of injury. Right? That's where they normally are uh, essentially recruited. The area gets sticky to them. Right? So they accumulate there. And where, if you were a cancer cell and you wanted to metastasize, don't you want the easiest way out? Take me to an injury, platelet. Let me out at an injured place, please. Right? This is your captain speaking. Okay. Everyone know him? <laughs> How many people take the shuttle? How many people? <laughs> yeah, Mary. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can clog. And, and one, of the, one of the things associated with cancer is people do throw clots. Uh, that's the whatever. They, they do get clots that leave, and, and you can have strokes and stuff that are caused by it. That's one of the, the things that is associated with cancer is increased risk of stroke right? and, heart, and heart attack because you can get clots.
Right? And the platelets also, by nature of what they do, are able to loosen the junctions between endothelial cells. Right? Uh, and so that makes it easier for the cancer cells to leave. Right? And cancer cells, the epithelial cells, often travel either with other cancer cells. Come on, we're going this way. Right? They'll, they'll bring the uh, cancer cell with them, or they will bring uh, other uh, stromal cells, like fibroblasts. Right? And they almost always will see uh, in, uh, essentially, oops, sorry, we'll see in, uh, right after spring break, right, we're going to do this paper, right, which demonstrated how cancer cells move with friends, right? Their safety in numbers. Right? Maybe the ones on the outside get damaged by oxygen, but maybe if you travel in sort of a little sphere, you're protected in the middle. That's sort of some of the thinking. Right? Uh, so again, we'll, we'll talk about this when we come back. And I The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.